Welcome to the presentation explaining how to answer question 18 from the May 2011 um, Edexcel Physics on the Go um, paper. Pause the video and read the introduction to this question. Okay, so the question is about uh, a fly gun that uh, has a spring in it that can be compressed and used to fire this projectile which is supposed to swat and kill a fly. Uh, pause the video and read this question. Okay, so we're given a force compression graph, which is just almost exactly the same idea as a um, force extension graph, uh, but this time the spring's getting shorter instead of longer, and it asks us to find the spring constant. It says show that the force constant, it means the spring constant. Uh, so we just have to find the gradient of this graph. So the easiest and most accurate way of doing this is to do it, since it's just a straight line from the origin, uh, to read out, and this comes out to be about halfway up one of these, so it's not quite 7.8, not quite 7.6, so it's 7.7 .7 there at 0.8, so gradient is equal to uh, delta y over delta x, and the change in y was 7.7, .7, from 0 to 7.7, .7. change in x was from 0 to 0 0.8, uh, and since it's in centimeters, the common mistake students make is to forget to convert into meters. So I can do times 10 to the minus 2, or I could just divide 0 0.8 by 100, which would give me the same thing. So if I just tap that into my calculator, I get uh, 962.5 newtons per meter. Okay, so it takes 962.5 newtons for every meter of compression with this spring. That's enough to get both of those marks. Okay, so pause the video and read this question. Okay, so now we're being asked to show that the energy stored in the spring before firing is about one joule. We're told that the spring is 6.3 centimeters long before it is compressed, and it, the length of the spring reduces to 1.6 centimeters after it is compressed. So the compression of the spring will just be 6.3 minus 1.6, which is 4.7 centimeters. If you divide that by 100, or you could just type into your calculator 4.7 times 10 to the minus 2, uh, it is actually 0 0.047 uh, meters. So we need to work in meters, otherwise we'll get uh, the wrong answer. Okay, so. We have the compression of the spring, and uh, we actually have from the previous question the spring constant, okay, uh, which we calculated here. This was the spring constant. Uh, so normally, if you want to calculate the energy stored in the spring, it's the area under the force extension graph, and it works the same for compression graph, okay. Uh, the reason why it's area under this graph is because uh, you're, applying, you're doing work on a spring, essentially. You're, you're applying a force through a distance. The force is changing, so you have to take the average force, and it essentially works out to be the same as being the area underneath the graph. So uh, if you could say that a half the force multiplied by the distance you um, applied that force through, which would be the compression, would give you the area under the graph or the um, energy stored, um, what we don't have here is the force. But what we did have was uh, an expression that could give us the force. Since for a spring, F is equal to the spring constant multiplied by extension, we could just substitute F for this term and use a half. And then since extension or compression, um, they're interchangeable and the distance traveled or compression are going to be the same thing. It's just going to be a half k x squared. So I'm going to use this equation and substitute the numbers into that here. So it's a half the spring constant, which I calculated to be 96, and I'll just round it up to 963, um, multiplied by x, which is this number here, 0 0.047 sorry, um, squared. Okay? And putting the numbers into my calculator gives me 1.0636, and if I round that up, it's 1.1 joule. Okay, so that's my answer. Matches up nicely with that. That's enough to get both marks. Okay, pause the video and read this next question. 
Okay, so it tells us that the, um, again, the question's quite nice. It tells us the answer we're expecting. This means that if you got stuck, you could continue in the next parts of the question using their answer. But hopefully you can calculate your own answer. So uh, we're told the mass of the spring, uh, of the, um, spring and the uh, projectile, which is all going to fly together, the disk and the spring. Um, and we need to find out the speed given the energy. Okay, So we know the energy, we need the speed. We know the energy, we know the mass, we need the speed. So we can use, uh, since we have the energy, energy available, energy available, it should be equal to the kinetic energy of the projectile. So uh, the energy, which is 1.1, should be equal to a half mv squared, and mass would be this mass. Uh, so you can rearrange that, it'll become 2, get rid of the half, multiply both sides by 2, so it gets 2.2. .2. Uh, get rid of the mass on this side, divide both sides by mass. This leaves me 2.2 .2 over m is equal to v squared. Get rid of the squared, take the root of v squared. It's going to root 2.2 .2 over m should be equal to v. Uh, m is going to be, I'm just going to convert this 9.4 into uh, kilograms. 9.4 times 10 to the minus 3. Okay, so I'm just going to substitute that for that root 2.2 .2 over 9.4 times 10 to the minus 3. And the answer, yeah, just quickly do that, 15.2984. Uh, so I'll just round that to 15.3 meters per second. And that's my answer. Okay, so what was the assumption that was made in this question? The assumption made was that all of the strain energy was converted into kinetic. And gee. Okay, bad hand row, but hopefully you've understood from me speaking. Okay, uh, pause the video and read this question. Okay, so this question is a little bit more tricky, okay? So the gun is aimed at a wall three meters away. Okay, so here's our wall. And this distance here is three meters. And uh, it wants us to calculate the velocity of the disc as it hits the wall. Now remember, velocity is a vector quantity. Um, if you know anything about projectiles, you should know that uh, if a projectile, if, if you can ignore air resistance, then the horizontal component of the projectile's velocity will remain constant, and the vertical component will increase. So the projectile will follow a path. Just change the color. The projectile will follow a path something like this, a parabolic curve. Okay. And when it gets to this point here, it's going to have a certain horizontal, a certain vol vertical velocity and a certain horizontal velocity. The answer that we're looking for is going to be the sum of those two vectors, which would be, I could draw a, uh, I could just finish these off, and then the sum would be, uh, adding that vector to that vector, or, or whichever way around you want to do it. And the magnitude of this red arrow would be the sum of the horizontal and vertical components of velocity. So in order to find the magnitude and the angle to the horizontal, I need to find um, the vertical velocity. I already have the horizontal velocity, as calculated in the previous question. Um, we got 15.3 meters per second. So I know the size of this arrow, 15.3 meters per second. What I need to find is this. Okay, <clears throat> so the wall is three meters away. Okay, so I need to know how long it takes to get to the wall in order to know the time that my uh, that the projectile was falling for. So speed is equal to distance divided by time. Time is equal to whoops, time is equal to um, distance divided by speed. Three meters divided by fifteen point three gives me. Uh, Get my calculator, 0 0.205, so 0 0.2 seconds. So the time it takes to fall 
is 0.2 seconds. Now I need to know the vertical velocity achieved in that time. So if something falls at uh, the acceleration of gravity for 0.2 seconds, how fast will it be going? Well, this is where you can use um, one of your equations of motion. And the simplest one to use would be this one. So I'm just going to use this. This will be in the uh, formula sheet at the back of your paper. Um, so the, I'm trying to find velocity. The initial velocity in the, in the vertical component is going to be zero. Acceleration will just be acceleration due to gravity. Again, you can find that at the back of your formula sheet. Uh, multiplied by the time it takes to fall, which is here, 0.2 seconds. Um, yeah, okay, so 9.81 times 0.2 gives me 1.96 uh, seconds. So this is the time it takes to fall. Sorry, no, this is the um, silly mistake. This is the uh, velocity in the vertical component. Okay, so this is in meters per second. So this is the magnitude of this arrow, arrow which will be 1.96 meters per second. And actually what I'm going to do is to keep things uh, making sense and to scale, because it's just so much easier to understand what you're doing when you draw these diagrams to scale, I'm going to uh, try and actually keep things roughly to scale. So this arrow is a bit smaller, okay? And the sum of the arrows will look something like this. Okay? It wants me to find the arrows angle, uh, angles of the horizontal, which will be this angle, and the magnitude of the velocity, which is just the size of this arrow. Okay? So the size of that arrow, the size of this is 1.96, the size of that is 1.96. I can just use Pythagoras to find this. So I can use a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. Uh, which would just give me 1.96 squared plus 15.3, whoops, 15.3, 15.3 squared should be equal to c squared, root of all that, 1.96 squared plus 15.3 squared will just give me c. That's taking the root of both sides, cancels out the squared there. Okay, so I have to do this on my calculator. So, okay, it's uh, 15.42. So I'm going to round that to just 15.4 meters per second. That's where the answer came from. Um, so now I want to find this angle. Um, and I'm going to just label up my triangle using the uh, standard, you know, old school method, Sokar, Toa, and so on. Okay, this is the hypotenuse of the triangle. This is opposite the angle I want to find. This is adjacent the angle I want to find. So since I've got uh, the best numbers to use are these ones, the ones I haven't calculated, because I calculated this, there may be a mistake there. So I'll use this one and this one. O and A, Sokar, Toa, uh, I'll be using tan. So uh, let's go back to red. Um, to find the angle, I made a bit of a mess of this, how I've calculated it, but I'll do it here, okay? To find the angle, I'll be using tan theta, the angle I want to find, should be equal to opposite over adjacent. The opposite side is 1.96. The adjacent is 15.3. Okay, this is all equal to tan theta. So now you need to do the inverse of tan to find theta on its own, okay? So tan to the minus 1. Uh, of 1.96 over 15.3 should give me the answer. Okay, I'll just calculate that. So I'm doing 1.96 divided by 15.3 and then pressing shift tan and answer on my calculator and that gets me 7.3 degrees. 7.3 degrees. So this angle here is actually 7.3. Okay, pause the video, read this next question. Okay, so, the fly is 20 centimeters below the horizontal level which the gun was fired. Let's just go back to this previous thing here. So, if we can imagine that was a straight line, and I haven't drawn it very well, the fly is about, this is, say, 20 centimeters, 0.2 meters below. Um, and the radius of the uh, fly swat is about 
three, sorry, the diameter of the fly swat is three centimeters. So we're being asked, is the fly going to get splattered by this uh, shot? So what we need to work out is how far the disc falls. Again, we can use our SUVA equation. Okay, um, we know how long the um, we know how long the disc was falling for in the vertical. Um, that was 0.2 meters per second squared. So we know the time, and we know the acceleration, and we're trying to find the distance. So it's this one here. Okay, we have t, we have a. That's everything we need. Initial velocity in the vertical component was zero, so this won't matter anyway. So I'm just going to substitute the numbers into this. Since u is equal to zero, I won't bother putting that there. S is equal to a half, 80, which is going to be 9.81. T is 0.2 squared. Okay. So um, uh, substitute the number. Sorry, uh, just calculate that on my calculator. It gives me 0.19. Uh, one point nine. 0.196. Okay, so 0.196 is 19.6 uh, centimeters. Okay, 19.6 centimeters. So if you've got something with a diameter, so a radius. Oh, actually, it's a radius, right? So it's actually got. It's actually quite big. It's six centimeters across here. Right. Um, if you add the midway point, where will the middle of this disc hit, right? The middle of this disc is going to hit, say, at 19.6 centimeters. So the overlap is going to be an extra three centimeters over this. So it's easily going to hit the fly. Okay, so yes, the fly will be squashed. Okay. Um, you can maybe do this, 19.6 plus 3 centimeters gives you uh, 22.6 centimeters. And you can, you can see that the overlap makes it. Okay, so suggest an advantage of using the disk used over a solid disk. So just go back quickly and look at the disk that was used. The disk, you can see, has got uh, corrugations and it's cut out, right, to let air pass through probably so the thing can move more quickly through the air. Instead of just being a parachute or a, a solid block, it's got holes cut in it, um, smaller than a fly, so that it can move uh, easily through the air. So you could just say to reduce air resistance. Use air resistance. Okay. Okay, so uh, I think that's it. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please uh, make them. I hope you found this video useful.